Hello, I'm Jeffrey Mishlove, host of Thinking Aloud. Our topic today is the Sanskrit tradition. My guest is Dr. Dean Brown, a theoretical physicist, Sanskrit scholar, entrepreneur, and translator of the Upanishads and the Yoga Sutras. Welcome, Dean. I'm very glad to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you. You know, I think many people who speak English don't realize that our own language, as well as most Western languages, have their origins in what is sometimes called the Proto-Indo-European language, which is really the, the, the same language from which Sanskrit and uh, the Hindu uh, traditions are derived. Yes, uh, English, uh, Russian, Icelandic, French, Greek uh, are all uh, dialects of uh, a mother tongue that's uh, spoken very widely in India and many parts of the world. We think of ourselves as, as being Western, and we think of India and its culture as being Eastern, but actually they, they have not only a common linguistic origin, but a, a common cultural basis as well. Yes, common thought. Uh, if we divide East and West, I would put the boundary between India and China, perhaps. But India is Western, by my way of thinking. Well, and Buddhism, which uh, was born in India and then moved to China, bridges that gap as well. So Buddhism is the West that went to the East. There we have uh, a, a, an example of uh, how we're much more intimately related to Eastern culture than we think, and uh, many, many, many words in the English language have Sanskrit origins, or origins that are traceable to uh, the Sanskrit tradition in the earlier Proto-Indo-European language. Oh, yes. Most of the words in, in English, say, go back either through the Teutonic Northern European uh, uh, Icelandic uh, root to the uh, Sanskrit or the Vedic and then through the uh, Mediterranean root, the Romance root. Mm -hmm. Now we think of Sanskrit as a language of mysticism, the language of the Bhagavad Gita, of the Yoga Sutras, of the Vedas, the, the language in which there, there's the great equation, uh, Atman equals Brahman. The, let, let's start there. Maybe we can, uh, you could elaborate on that. Well, Sanskrit's an artificial language uh, spoken in the wisdom traditions and in the great hymns. The uh, language spoken in the street in ancient times would be called Vedic. Vedic is a vernacular and Sanskrit is a synthetic language. Just like the uh, Latin that Julius Caesar spoke would be vernacular, but the Latin that we have in medicine and law and botany and the church is not the street language. So Sanskrit was a, a formal language Very used formal. by the priests and by the philosophers of ancient times. Yes. Uh, and it is very beautiful, but uh, it wouldn't give you much of an idea of what's actually spoken in the bazaar. But there, are, there's a lot of abstractions uh, that we find in Sanskrit that have permeated our, our modern idiom. Concepts like karma, concepts like Brahma. Yes, that's why we think of uh, Sanskrit as a scientific language. Mm -hmm. The terms in Sanskrit are so precise that they're used in the street today in, in California, for instance, because the English equivalents don't exist. There are many, many words in Sanskrit that describe states of consciousness. States of consciousness, thinking, mentality. Uh, there are other languages that have feelings in them, but Sanskrit has precision for thought and consciousness. And metaphysics. And metaphysics, yes. And, co and, and cosmology. Itself. Now, you've translated the Upanishads very ancient and, and revered sacred texts. You uh, have described to me how these texts are really to be chanted. They're, they're like poetry in a way, and yet they have a precision to them. Could, could you read uh, one, of, uh, one of those? Yes. Uh, there are a couple hundred Upanishads uh, known today, and when the the rishis, the teachers, uh, started 
teaching the Upanishads to the Western scholars a couple hundred years ago or 150 years ago. They were very open in chanting them at first, and then they realized that if they're written down, they lose some of the power. Mm. So only about a hundred of them have been uh, written, and the rest are still in the verbal tradition. Orally the oral transmitted, tradition, memorized. Which is the origin of all wisdom, mm -hmm. is in the oral tradition. Mm -hmm. But to give you an idea of some of the melody in these yeah. documents, um, I take the beginning of the Isha of Ashapanishad, which goes like this. Om, the sound of the universe. The sound of the universe, from which we get our modern word of human, om, humble, full that, full this. From the full, everything has come out. Having taken everything out of it, the full alone remains. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace. In the world whatsoever changeful is, all this with the Lord should be enveloped. By that renunciation, support yourself. Do not covet the wealth of anyone. Only for performing good deeds should one desire to live a hundred years. Only thus and in no other way will your work not have stains. It actually is in some ways reminiscent of uh, the Old Testament. Don't covet things, do good. Oh yes, the ideas are the same. There, there is a universal ethic. But then there's something a little deeper in there about non-attachment. Oh, yes, the ideas have many layers of meaning. They just go on and on. Uh, you can take one of these sutras and dig in it forever. Mm -hmm. The word sutra is interesting. Uh, it's the same word that we have in the hospital if you sew up a sutra. word. A sutra. A sutra means a string, a string of pearls. So these uh, ancient... Uh, Poems are uh, called sutras. They're strings of pearls. Mm -hmm. They're really like uh, They're tied together. nuggets of wisdom. Nuggets of wisdom, right. In a and that's why I read it with pauses between the lines, because each line has multiple meanings. And if you pause, it sinks into the subconscious more. Now, I think it's very interesting what you said earlier about the word human. We're all human, but very rarely do we pause to think what does that word mean and here you've traced it to a, a Sanskrit root alm or which is the the, the eternal sound of the it's universe the eternal sound from which the universe is expressed mm -hmm. so everything that's in the universe is human everything that's alive is human homo sapiens among other things is human but we won't be around very long humanity will prevail long after Homo sapiens has been forgotten. And the Vedic tradition is one that has this sense of eternal cycles. Uh, Lots of time. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the Veda there are epochs of time that come and go like a big wheel. We're coming to the end of an epoch right now, which is one of the worst ones. And the we'll, Kali Yuga. The Kali Yuga. And we'll come a, around to a better time. Yeah. If you don't like these times, hang on. Better mm -hmm. times are coming. Well, it's interesting to me, Dean. You have a, had had a career in theoretical physics, and many theoretical physicists, such as yourself, have studied the Sanskrit tradition. Many of the great physicists have made a point of it. Yes. Physicists like the uh, Sanskrit tradition because uh, the cosmologies that were written down, uh, how the universe came about, uh, apply pretty much today. In other words, that th there's a sense amongst physicists that uh, the, the precision, the rigor, the depth of insight amongst the ancient Sanskrit uh, wise people, the rishis, uh, speaks to us today, to the scientific mind. Oh, very much so. Uh, 
the story is told about uh, Oppenheimer, Robert Oppenheimer, when he saw the first blast, nuclear blast at Alamogordo. And the press mm -hmm. said, what were you thinking when you saw the first atomic bomb? And he said, well, I was thinking of the dance of Shakti. The dance of Shakti. Yeah, and as I recall, he used a quote from the Bhagavad Gita to describe the atomic bomb, yes. brighter than 10,000 suns. Brighter than 10,000 suns, yeah. So th this is called, the, the Vedic writing and the Upanishads are called science by people who have studied them, mm -hmm. not only in ancient times, but today. Yeah. Science meaning to discriminate between this and this. Mm. Well, Dean, we're going to be uh, taking a break shortly. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. We've got a lot to explore about the Sanskrit tradition and its relevance to us in our lives. Thank you. Welcome back to Thinking Aloud. I'm your host, Jeffrey Mishlove. We're talking about the Sanskrit tradition with physicist and Sanskrit scholar Dean Brown. Earlier, Dean, I mentioned what you might even think of as an equation. Atman equals Brahman, which to me is one of the fundamental insights of the Sanskrit tradition. The idea is, I think, the essence within each of us, Atman, is the same as the essence of the whole universe, Brahman. Yes, the biggest thing that you can think of is Brahman, ever expanding. It is all the universe and all the many universes, if we have parallel universes, all summed up into one unbounded, expanding everything. And also the supreme deity. And the supreme deity, Brahma. On the other scale, the smallest thing you can think about is your center. And your true self is smaller than any of the parts that go to make it up. It's not your body. It's not your ego. It's not your self-image. It's essential inside of all of those. And the equation of the Veda is Atman equals Brahman. That which is everything is that which is your essence, personally. That seems to be at the heart of all mysticism, really. Yes, I think all other forms of mysticism, all the other tra traditions, all the other cultures arrive at the same point. I think the Vedic is the most uh, extended and most sophisticated version of it, but I think that we're all saying the same thing. It, it's sort of like the E equals MC squared of metaphysics. Ah, it is that and much more, yes. And, and if I understand the Vedic tradition, the Sanskrit tradition, it is out of this insight that, that a whole a science of metaphysics unfolds. Yes, from this point, Atman equals Brahman, we get the whole cosmology of the ancient uh, Indians, the ancient Greeks is derived from it because Greek is a Vedic uh, subculture and Latin, uh, our modern science is derived from it. Mm -hmm. uh, all of that comes uh, in its many forms down to us in, mo in the modern form of Advaita, Vedanta. Vedanta means the fulfillment of the Vedas. Veda means wisdom. And Advaita means not two. That which is the biggest is not different from that which is the smallest. So when we think of Hindu culture, for example, as being polytheistic, uh, and we don't understand this Advaita tradition, we're missing something very important about the way they understand their relationship to their deities. 
Yes, indeed. The, uh, the uh, Vedic uh, tradition, the Vedic wisdom is so extensive that when a person comes to it, he brings himself to it first. So the first thing we find, one finds in the Veda is himself. And his polytheism, as it goes deeper and deeper in it, into it, becomes uh, a monotheism and beyond a monotheism. Even monotheism is not essential enough, not subtle enough to get the idea mm -hmm. that you ultimately find in the Veda. Yeah. Now, in Plato, we have the notion of the world of ideals. We call it the Platonic world, the world of pure forms. But th this is also oh, found in, in, oh, yeah. in the Vedic tradition. See, that's in the Veda, that's in Sanskrit, that's called the Ritam Bara Pragyan. Uh, Ritam uh, is where we get our word right. This is right. Uh, this is a right angle. Make a right turn at the corner. Uh, let's make it right. Let us let us correct something. Uh, that all c goes back to the Sanskrit idea of that which is perfect. Mm -hmm. And everything in the universe, everything is manifest, is imperfect. So the dynamic of the universe is to f for the imperfect to dynamically approach the perfect. Mm -hmm. And, and the metaphysics, the practical aspect, as I understand it, of the Vedic metaphysics is that through disciplines, through meditation, through centering oneself, we are able to apprehend that Ritambara world, that, that perfection, and then we can bring it into manifestation in our lives. Yes, by keeping your eye on the perfect, and letting your feet find the way in nature, we bring about the expression of perfection in the manifest. Mm -hmm. And so the word man, the, the Sanskrit root man, mankind, mind, mental, manifest, manual, are all part of our word human, mean manifest the ideal. Mm -hmm. So the word human combines that sense of aum, the sound of the universe, with the idea of, uh, of man. manual, Manifest. manual uh, taking action, using your hands, being here and now in the world. Yes. And even the word action comes from the Sanskrit idea of prakriti. To act comes from prakriti, and prakriti is the word for nature, practical. Mm practical is in contrast to theoretical. We have theory and praxis. Theory, theoretical, comes from the Sanskrit devas, deus in Greek, theos in Greek, deus in Latin, uh, divine, which originally means senses. Your senses are your devas. So, so God is your senses your perception of the universe. A very sensory experience is, is the way that we connect. Everything comes from your senses. Mm -hmm. Now, you have thousands of senses, but it's through all of your senses that you comprehend God, the universe. And the very idea that a human being can comprehend the divine, the, the infinite, is uh, particular in some way to the Sanskrit tradition, I think. Yes, indeed, and, by com and to comprehend the divine, which is to say everything, one comprehends oneself, one's Atman. Mm -hmm. The root to the divine is through the Atman. Mm -hmm. The root to everything that you sense or can sense is through your center. Now, now, the Sanskrit tradition, of course, is a vast literature. We have the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Mahabharata, the Bhagavad Gita, the Yoga Sutras, the Brahmanas, the Tantras. The Tantras. Well, the Tantras in particular are interesting because, as I understand it, they're really the oldest of these traditions. Yes, the Tantras are the shamanic practices of the proto Vedic people. The Indo-European people. The Indo-European people, which are parallel to all shamanic people. And uh, it evolved into 
the Vedas and the science and theory. Mm -hmm. But they started as rituals and practices of uh, nomadic people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we have a sense in the West that spirituality is very otherworldly, sort of separate from our day-to-day -day practical experience. But as, as you explore the Sanskrit tradition, in particular its tantric origins, there is a different sense, uh, a, a sense of oneness, of, of our, our sensuality and our spirituality uh, really coming together, as, as you expressed earlier in the very word, devas. Yes, God is approached through nature. Just as in the, uh, the Hebrew Kabbalah, the uh, Ein Sof, uh, the God is approached through the Shekinah, mm -hmm. who is approached through the Malkut, the, the nature. Mm -hmm. So one gets to God through nature, and one gets to nature through God. Uh -huh. Now you've done something very interesting here, and I know you're a scholar of many traditions as well as Sanskrit. By bringing in the Hebrew, I think it's useful to point out to our viewers that when it, when it comes to human culture, there are many different streams. Hebrew, the Sanskrit, perhaps the Chinese, the, yeah, the metaphor, the Polynesian, the American the, Indian, American Indian, the African. That Mayan. It, it, linguistically, they're quite separate, but yet, in terms of of the sense of the the world, one might say that they all have their origins in a in a kind of common human culture, which we might describe as shamanic. Yes, they're based on experience. The raw native experience of any person where he comes from the the home and the hearth and the field and the hunt uh, lead to our metaphysics and all these forms of metaphysics are isomorphic mm -hmm. isomorphic meaning the same form mm -hmm. they have the the same form they're uh, different ways of saying the same thing and and yet uh, they, they appear quite different superficially, but they all reduce down to experience. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very interesting as we're exploring the Sanskrit tradition, what you're saying here is, is that although it d doesn't share much history with the Hebrew tradition or the Polynesian tradition, when, when you begin exploring it in its depth, it's the same. We come to the same thing, yes. Mm -hmm. The Vedic way is a nice way to do it because it is so thoroughly developed. Mm -hmm. But one can do it in Polynesia just as well. Yeah. Well, we're going to be exploring some of the practical aspects of the Sanskrit tradition. In part two of this program, we'll be looking at the Yoga Sutras in particular, where we have a very specific, detailed, step-by-step -step instruction for achieving the kind of insights. Dean, thank you for being with me. And thank you for being with us.